If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite your attention to the book of the Revelation. The book of the Revelation, chapter number three. As we will attempt to preach this morning, through the help of the Holy Spirit of God, I believe the church that describes many modern day churches in America, the apathetic assembly. Revelation chapter number three, we'll begin reading in verse number 14, and read down through the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. But then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you will bless it today. Help to stir our hearts, dear Lord. We ask, dear Father, your Spirit to move us, that, Lord, we would be able to bring glory to your name And, Lord, we would be able to depend on you totally in all things. Our Father, we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Apathy. The absence or suppression of passion, emotion, or excitement. I find that in a lot of churches. In the day and age in which we live. I find it in a lot of Christians in the day and age in which we live. They're not excited about the things of God. They're not excited about the Word of God. They're not excited to be Christians. And we should be. Man, I should be excited that I'm born again. Shouldn't you be excited that you're born again? Instead of being like the horse that the farmer said, why the long face? Some of you got that joke. I want you to notice there in verse number 14 that it says, Christ says there unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. In the previous six letters, the Bible uses the word at. The church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamos. But notice here, it's not the church at Laodicea. It's the church of the Laodiceans. And what that tells me is that Christ was not a part of this church. He had given it over to them. 
Verse number 20 indicates that as well as he is on the outside of the Laodicean church knocking on the door. Asking the church to let him in. And my friends, if the Lord doesn't show up to worship with us today, nothing's going to happen. And I have seen that week after week after week. Where nothing happens. This final letter here is addressed to an affluent an apathetic church. Christ charges this church with being lukewarm as we read. And beneath this, con beneath this condemnation of Christ there is an even more heart-searching lesson. The result of self-complacency. And that result is lukewarmness. Didn't we see that in the history of the nation of Israel after God had given them the land and everything that was in it? What happened to the nation of Israel? As God gave them houses that they didn't have to build and vineyards that they didn't have to plant and olive, and olive, and, and olive orchards that were already there. The Bible says they forgot God. And they went after idols. I think the church today is very similar in that regard. We have become complacent. Therefore, we have come become lukewarm. And it's impossible for a self-complacent people to be anything but lukewarm. Christ would rather his church be cold or hot. I think he'd prefer hot to cold. But he cannot tolerate a lukewarmness. Let us look here at these verses to see how we can avoid in our life this lukewarmness and not have Christ knocking at our heart's door asking us to let him in, but have him already there sitting on the throne, which is his rightful place in our hearts and lives. We see the inscription this morning in verse number 14. That word there, angel, it means a messenger. It implies here the pastor. This letter is addressed to the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans. It is written to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea was a very prosperous city. It was a center for Sheep with black wool. So I guess it was a city of black sheep. Textiles were one of the major industries there in Laodicea, along with banking and medicine. It was a very beautiful city to be able to look at. The authority that is here that is writing this letter, of course, is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle John that was told to write this letter to them. The Almighty, the Amen. The way that the Lord spoke in His statements that are true. His promises that can be trusted. It's the faithful and true witness. Everything our Lord says is true. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Every promise that God gives us in his word is true. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. And we should believe that. 
There's no minimizing or exaggeration with the Lord. As he speaks to this church, he speaks the whole truth about this church. He puts everything on the table. He chastises them for their self-complacency and lukewarmness. And why does he do that? Because he loves them. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son. If we're not living right for the Lord and the Lord is not chastening our heart in life, there's a big problem. We need to examine our heart in life. Examine our relationship with the Lord. And if one exists or not. Christ describes himself as the beginning of the creation of God. There in verse number 14. John chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word. Speaking of Christ. And the word was with God and the word was God. There are many churches and many so-called Christian faiths that do not believe that Jesus is God. They throw that aside. He was a good man, he was a good teacher, but he was just a man. Not according to my Bible. We see the inventory, the appraisal. I know thy works there in verse number 15. Nothing positive was said by the Lord of this church. As we read this letter. The Lord could not find anything good about these folks. In other letters, in the previous letters, there was something that he could find that was good about those churches. But not here. God knew their works. Just as he knows our works. God knew their hearts just as he knows our hearts. And the works of the Laodicean church fell short. Because they were lukewarm. The indictment. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. The desired state of the Lord was rather to be cold or hot. You know, when things are cold, they're pretty good. Ice cream is pretty good cold, don't you think? I think so. I know there are some, you know, that like to have it a little melty and, you know, put it in the microwave for 10 seconds so that's not so hard. Not me. Ice cream was meant to be cold and it was meant to be solid. I like a good cold drink as well. When things should be cold, they're good. When things should be hot, they're good. I like a hot soup. Cooked meats and mashed potatoes, the way they should be. They should be hot. You ever have a lukewarm meal? You ever went, you, did you ever go to a restaurant and things were not presented hot to the table? You go on Yelp, give that restaurant a review, it's not going to be a good one. Mm, two and a half stars. The service was good, but the food was meh.
See, the Bible teaches us that it is impossible for the Christian to be neutral. We are either cold for the Lord or we're hot for the Lord. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. There's no fence to straddle. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 30 tells us this. Christ speaking to his disciples there in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12. And in verse number 30. As Christ here is being accused by the Pharisees and the scribes of casting out devils in the name of in the name of Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Part of that argument, he says there in verse number 30, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You see, we see the disgusting state of this church, their indifference. Christ condemns their attitude of indifference, their lukewarmness. One of the hardest feelings to combat in our life is that of indifference, especially in the society that we live in that is so indifferent. We live in an indifferent age. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody. That's okay. If I'm born again, I can live my life however I want as long as I'm not hurting anybody. That's okay. I'm still going to go to heaven. I've got my get out of hell free card. Many Christians today, I believe, especially in America, are living carnally, worldly. And that worldliness that has crept into their life has made them indifferent about the things of God. That is what happened in the late Odyssean church. The problem that we have with winning the loss to Christ today isn't hostile opposition that we have. Because we don't have that here in America. Other countries do. But we do not. Yet. The problem with winning the loss today is complete indifference for the lost. Many don't care if their neighbor doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior and will spend a Christless eternity in hell. Or whether their brother or their sister in their family is lost without Christ and will spend a Christless eternity in hell. They don't care. They're indifferent. And that's why souls aren't getting saved. Because of indifference. See, the lost don't care about their condition. In fact, the lost don't know their condition. They don't know they're lost.
And it seems today that those who know Christ as Savior don't care about, don't care about the lost or their condition. Dear like David, when David wrote in Psalm 142, No man careth for my soul. See, I'm glad someone cared about my soul. I'm glad that someone cared enough to be able to give me the word of God. So it could convict my heart. I'm thankful for a man by the name of Brother Morgan who preached the Word of God at church camp on June 12, 1978 so that I could come to know Christ as my personal Savior. He cared enough to go to that camp and to preach to those teenagers so I could get saved. And you have people like that in your life if you know Christ as your personal Savior too. They cared enough about you to tell you about Jesus. So you could get saved. And we should care too. We see the destitute church here that is in Laodicea. The church was convinced of its wealth and blind of its poverty. The Laodicean church was worldly rich and spiritually poor. The church claimed it was rich and increased in goods and in need of nothing, including the Lord. And there are churches like that. Churches that depend on their programs. And on their people. And on their wealth. But they won't use a penny of that wealth to be able to go tell someone about Christ. Their programs are so great that, and so well organized and they run so well and so efficiently, they don't need to have Christ in them. See, Christ had a very different picture of the Laodicean church than the Laodiceans had. They thought they had everything made, they were wealthy, and they were doing good, and they were content and complacent. Christ saw the church as wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The Laodiceans, they were proud of themselves, but the Lord felt sorry for them and pitied them. This poor church was blind to their spiritual condition. The Lord now instructs them and gives them counsel. counsel of the Lord is to buy of the Lord who will take care of their spiritual poverty, their nakedness, and their blindness. Gold tried into fire to represent the divine righteousness of God given to us by His grace. The white raiment The righteousness of the saints, according to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. To be clothed in his righteousness. 
is to be freed from the shame of nakedness. But many try to use their own ways and their own righteousness to be able to cover up their nakedness. And we can't do that. Adam and Eve tried that. And the fig leaves didn't work. The Lord told them to use eye salve or spiritual discernment. Unless the Lord opened their eyes, we cannot discern spiritual things. The Bible says that the natural man cannot discern the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, to paraphrase the verse. The lost cannot understand the word of God because the lost do not have the spirit of God within them to give them understanding. The saved can understand the word of God because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us to give us the understanding of the word of God. God opens the eyes of understanding and we will never know the truth that makes us free until that happens. In chastisement of this church, the Lord tells them to repent. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and he scourgeth every soul. He tells them to be zealous. Many are living close enough to the world to be chilled by it and close enough to the church to be warmed by it. Thus they are lukewarm. The, conden the condensation... Verse number 20 of our text, Jesus is on the outside of his church here, looking in. He's knocking at the door. And the pictures that I have seen of this that artists have painted is that there's no door handle on the outside of that door that Jesus is knocking. There's only a door handle on the inside of the door. That tells me that only we can let Christ into our heart and life. Only we can let Christ in for salvation. As believers in Christ, only we can let Christ in for giving our bodies a living sacrifice. Only we can let Christ in so that he can sit on the throne of our heart. How many of you here this morning, Christ is knocking at the door of your heart? Asking, begging, pleading for you to let him in. If the Lord's knocking on the door of your heart this morning, now's the time to open the door and let him in so that he will sup with you and you with him and you will walk with him and he will walk with you and you will have fellowship with him and he will have fellowship with you and you will have a relationship together of a sweet communion A picture of the glories of heaven to come.
And when we do let Christ in, we have Christ in dwelling in us, we fellowship with him, and the fellowship is sweet. In the verse 21, the incentive, we have the triumph, the overcomer. In the book of 1 John, chapter 5, and verse 4, the Bible tells us about the victory that overcometh the world. First John 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Do you have faith enough in God to claim that victory? He talks about the throne, that we will rule and reign with Christ in glory, just as Christ reigns today and sits on his Father's throne. And then for the believer, there's the thrill of being with the Lord for all eternity. To lift up and praise the name of Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. How great that will be. This letter addresses the dangers facing the lukewarm church today. A church that is self-sufficient and unconscious of its spiritual condition and its needs. The Laodicean church was a self-complacent church. Complacency leads to lukewarmness and lukewarm Believers are self-complacent. And this truth reveals the source of the grave, cons grave and conspicuous evil that exists in churches. When one is complacent and one is self-centered, the heart is hopeless. As we mentioned, Christ prefers his church to be either cold or hot. I believe rather hot than cold, but not lukewarm. The lukewarm church makes Christ sick. I will spew thee out of my mouth. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I appreciate your time and attention this morning. We prepare for the invitation. I ask you, as I have asked myself here recently. Are you indifferent to the word of God, to the things of God, to his church? To people? Have you lost your desire to serve the Lord?
Do you need the Lord to light a fire in your soul today, to stir you up? So that you can be on fire for the Lord. I want to be able to pray for you this morning. If you find yourself in any of these states this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I'm not going to embarrass your soul. I want you to lift up your hand. Father, we pray and ask that your word would take effect in our life, that you would stir us up and stir up our hearts, that you'd be able to work your will and way. We ask you now, Lord, to use us in a great way to see others come to know you as Savior, to see the fruit of our labor, that God would receive the glory. That we would be a church filled with the Holy Spirit of God where Christ comes and is welcome every time the doors are open. We pray, dear Lord, that we would not be that complacent, selfish church, but a church that's on fire for you. If the Lord is speaking to your heart this morning, then you need to come and let the Lord light a fire in you this morning to stir up the embers of your heart that a flame may come to burn again. So we stand together to sing the invitation, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. If the Lord is speaking to your heart this morning. You come as we sing.